by all means, like anytime you release a new product, let your members have access to it first. This is Joe Shellerud from Ad Advance. Hi, this is Lindsay Hagerman of Raincaper.com. Hey, it's Jay Myers. I'm with Bold Commerce. And you're listening to... And you're listening to... And you're listening to The the Ecom Ecom Show. Show. Welcome to The Ecom Show, presented by Blue Tusker, the number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e-commerce experts where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Math. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Ecom Show. I'm your host, Andrew Math, and today, this is going to be a good one. I'm super excited for this one. I am joined by Jay Myers, one of the co-founders of Bold Commerce. Jay, how are you doing? You ready for a good show? I'm doing awesome, and thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I'm I'm super excited for this one. So we always have e-commerce sellers on the show, which I know you were an e-commerce seller. Are you still a seller yourself? Or uh, I assume you've probably pivoted to solely <laughs> at this point. I uh, I sell vicariously through a lot of friends and family members. But yeah, so I, um, <laughs> I, I built my first store in 1998, uh, sold for years. And that was kind of how... Um, I mean, we can get into it. It's kind of a fun story. But so now I actually... For fun, I spend a lot of time helping my brothers got a Shopify store. Um, I, I kind of feel like I'm a, still a store owner at heart, you know. Yeah, you never. You, I get it. Leaves you. Um, you can take the, the person out of the <laughs> out of the role, but you're always a store owner. Yeah. What? So I obviously we'll get into bold. Um, but what were you selling uh, back when you started in '98? I was selling archery supplies. <laughs> so. Uh, I was a, um, one of the, uh, actually like for like four years in a row, I was the Canadian archery, uh, national champion. I got really big into archery. And, what? uh, so we, st- <laughs> yeah, I could probably shoot an apple off your head. Well, not anymore. I'm pretty rusty now, but, um, <laughs> don't trust me. Don't ever let me do it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, uh, I was 13 years old and my brother was 16 and we both were really big into archery. And my dad said, Hey, do you guys want to start an archery store? And, uh, so my dad quit his job, remortgaged his house and we, uh, got, built a, like a, a pro shop. So there was a, a store and then 24 indoor lanes, kind of like a bowling alley concept. Like there's a lanes where you can practice shooting and then store mm-hmm. where you can buy all your gear. So I, I grew up, working in the retail store um, since I was 13. And then when I, when I was 18 and 98, um, convinced my dad, like said, Hey, like we should try selling some of the stuff online. And it actually ended up um, the way it started is a really funny story. I, uh, I, I did the ordering when I was 18 and my dad would always say, you know, like inventory costs money. It's ha- sitting, if it's sitting on shelf, that's money tied up. And if, if anyone here listening, they know this uh, as well as anyone inventory on a shelf is money tied up. Um, and so one day I ordered too many of this one type of bow. And I remember my dad like looking at it and saying like, you know, Jay, all I see is hundred dollar bills sitting up there on that wall of inventory <laughs> that we can't use for something else. Are we, if, if we're not going to sell it in 30 days, cause usually you get net 30 on your, on your inventory, mm-hmm. we're not going to sell it in 30 days. Why do we need that in stock? And I, um, and I said, okay, dad, I'm going to try selling it online. And actually the first thing I did was I put it on eBay and, uh, just as a test. And I ended up selling it for more than we were listing it for in the store. And, uh, so that was kind of like, really? bing, like eyes went open <laughs> and like, holy cow. Okay. So that we were selling this for like $300 in the store. And I don't remember what it was, but I sold it for like three fifty on eBay. Um, and that was like back in the days when eBay was like, the craze and everyone was selling on it. Like this was even like before Amazon was, was really even a thing. Um, and then eventually, so we did that for a while, but then eventually turned it into, um, our own brand and, uh, selling it. So like, you know, when you sell on eBay, you're kind of renting customers through eBay's traffic. You're not building a brand, you're getting sales and making money, but not building that long-term brand. So that was how it started. And then, uh, did that until, well, 2010, um, I moved one of the stores onto Shopify and it was store like number 6,000. It was really early in Shopify's days. Like they, wow. there was like hardly anything. I have a screenshot still from what the app store looked like. It was uh, app logos on wood, wooden shelves. It was like really <laughs> web, 
like web one. Well, I guess it was web 2.0, wow. but anyways, it was in that, in that transition stage. Yeah. Um, but, but it was, it was interesting because actually, you know, as, as archaic as the app store looked, it was, it was revolutionary because they, um, there was no other <clears throat> e-commerce platforms doing that. Like I had stores on big commerce. Mm-hmm. I had, um, another, like another one on the, uh, they're still around. It's called shop factory. They're in Australia. Um, I had stores on a number of different platforms and Shopify was the first one that had this concept of an app store. So like me being a merchant, I looked at this, like a kid in a candy store. I was like, I want this, I want this. I had this long list of ideas of, of things I wanted to build for my store. Um, and then that was kind of how bold came around. I one day ended up telling a buddy like, Hey, I got these great ideas. And there was to put this into perspective, there was about 40 apps in the app store at this time. Like there wasn't seven thousand like there is now, and there was like not. Bold's almost uh, got forty now, doesn't it? <laughs> we're all right around a hundred thousand. Yeah, so hundred thousand <laughs> apps. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Forty apps. I thought you meant forty. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're. You know what? We got up to thirty six, but we've pared down quite a bit. We've actually that's yeah. been a big thing for us in the last two years is trying to get a lot more focused. Um, but yeah, at one point we were we were close to forty. Yeah. So, so then, doubled what you originally had available. That's hilarious. The bold app store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, um, what's that story, yeah. right? Well, the story was, you know, so I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned it to one of one of the friends, and it was it was uh, a complete experiment, and we thought um, the original app that I actually wanted was for my own store. I wanted to build like a product comparison tool. You know, when you're shopping, like for backpacks or something, you can see, you can Mm -hmm. pick three different backpacks and compare the size and features and see them side by side. Um, We thought that was going to be too hard. So we said, well, let's just build a little like upsell app just as an experiment. And like, there was no, there was actually no front facing apps in the app store. They were all integrations. So by front facing, Mm -hmm. I mean, um, living on the front end of a store that customers interact with. So all the apps were, like integrate with uh, shipping carriers, integrate with accounting software, integrate with um, uh, like Google Shopping, things like that. There was a few of those around, yeah. but n- so those would run like batch jobs, and you could have. It, it didn't matter how much traffic was on the front. We built the uh, so our upsell app. Um, we kind of hacked Shopify's APIs a little bit. This was 2012 to put it in perspective. Now you don't have to hack anything. You can do this all completely <laughs> properly, but. Um, we used we made API calls on the front end of the store. So every time uh, a, a customer clicked add to cart, it did a, it did an API call to check which product should be recommended based off of which product was. Um, and there was and, and then it would recommend a product, but there was no API throttling. So we had um, I remember one of the first big stores that used our upsell was the Chive, and every time they would run a sale, they would take down all of Shopify. So this is around 20,000 stores. This is not like <laughs> 1.7 million now, but yeah. because they, they would run some, you know, m- messaging on social media or some promotion, drive a bunch of traffic, and then hundreds of thousands of people clicking add to cart, <laughs> triggering upsells, doing all those API calls, it would actually take, take down the whole platform. So early on, Shopify wasn't very happy about, about it, but then they quickly realized okay. no, the merchants love it. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great tool. So then they built in um, processes and API throttling and different ways to make apps that live on the front of the end of the store work. <clears throat> so then um, it took off, like in a nutshell, uh, stores loved it. Um, so then we kind of thought, well, okay, well, you know, what's the next app we're going to build? And um, we, uh, that was our strategy for a long time, just to build as many tools that would help merchants make more money. Cause like I was a merchant still, we actually kept our stores until I think it was about mid 2015. And, um, every single app we built, we used on the stores too. And so like we were, we were merchants and we were app developers at, equally at the same time. Um, and it also helped like from a product development standpoint, cause we were, we were building the products, using the products and, um, you know, it m- kind of gave us that, we're app developers, but we're merchants too. Um, but then after a while, you know, we had been in Bolt had been around for like three years and we thought, well, it's time to sell the stores and just focus on, on building the tools for the, for yeah. merchants. Cause at that point it, 
it had taken off. Like we were all fully employed by Bold. So yeah. So you mentioned that obviously you built you had up to 36 apps at one point. So obviously you guys kind of started going there. But then you said you you started pairing it back. So what is what are you guys focusing on now? Yeah, like I think right now there's probably about maybe 14 live in the app store. There's a lot that are um like none of them well like stores might still be using them but they're not publicly listed like you can't install them anymore but we're um but like that you can go to the app store and install yeah it's 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 just you know like in business it's it's kind of one of those things where um it's very hard to be good at everything and and we learned that um Mm -hmm. and you also you know people like to um uh uh, bucket you like when like right away like if i if i talk to you or if i see you on a they like to put you in this okay andrew he's like the marketing guy or he's this or he's this but if you you know have you ever you've probably been on these like agency websites that do everything they're like we do seo mm-hmm. we do marketing we do paid we do uh copy we do social media we do email marketing and then there's like some agencies that like we are the best at email marketing and that's it. And so yeah. who do you want to use? Do you want to use like the one who's the best at email marketing, the one who the best, best at paid, or do you want to use the agency that's like on their top menu? It's like literally every service you can think of. Um, and that's kind of how we felt like we felt like, Oh yeah, we're kind of doing all of this and they were all good apps, but a, a, a customer couldn't put us in a bucket and understand really what our value was. Um, Mm -hmm. so now like our, our focus is all around, um, subscriptions is a big, big focus of it. Um, and checkout and, and price rules. So we have a price rules engine that powers a lot of our stuff. And then, so that can power everything from our like customer pricing and upsell tools, quantity breaks, bundles, um, discount engine. Um, so a lot of the stuff around pricing, uh, that's kind of a big, Mm -hmm. big focus that, and then, and, uh, subscriptions as well. Yeah. So when you and I first started talking, I was super excited. So I was like, I've been a fan of Bold for, I mean, at this point, it's got to be like five, five or six years, I think. So <clears throat> prior to Blue Tusker, I was in house somewhere and they were originally on WooCommerce, which I'm sure mm. you know, like WordPress is a nightmare <clears throat> and there's so many different plugins. And I always had this issue where, you know, WordPress would update and, or one plugin would update or whatever, and it would cause the whole thing to break. And so I finally switched over to Shopify. And the last thing I really wanted to do was have a ton of different plugins, or in this case, mm-hmm. different apps from different companies. Because I'm like, I, I didn't know. I was like, if one of these updates, it breaks the whole thing. This is such a pain. Like, I hate this concept. And I came across Bold. And I'm like, this is great. I can finally commit to like one company that does everything <laughs> I needed to do so that I don't have to worry about anything. So when I first started, we had subscriptions. We had quantity breaks. We had upsell. Uh, I lived in in bold brain just because I thought it was fun, and so like oh, nice. a lot of times, like you know, I I as soon as you reached out, I was like, oh, it's gonna be great. And so it's funny to hear you kind of pivoted to that stuff because I did even like I would look in there. I was like, you guys have so many things. I was like, I don't even know what some of this stuff does. <laughs> so I, yeah, I would give away from it. But uh, I definitely <laughs> see a lot of people now catering to having like the quantity breaks and subscription type of option. So why do you feel that a lot of people are pivoting that way? Because obviously you're taking the business in that direction. So what what do you think is causing that? Um, there's so the reason why we care so much about subscriptions. We launched both subscriptions in uh, January 2015. So it's it's it, so that was our um, just for a quick little bit of context. We have two versions. One the the version that was for around for um, five and a half years, and it still is. We just call it V1. And then recently, there's a, a new version. We just call it V2. Um, it's not better. It's just different. And it's the one that works mm-hmm. with Shopify checkout. Um, but taking a step back, the um, subscriptions are... Ugh, man, they've evolved so much. So uh, like we see brands um, getting sold or acquired... Um, for sometimes like seven to 10 X their annual recurring revenue. Like what we're seeing, like what, what you'd value a software SaaS company. We're seeing e-commerce product companies um, be valued for. So, you know, when you're building a business, uh, if you build a subscription business versus a one-time order business, uh, you're just building such a more valuable business. 
And so the impact that it can have on people's lives is seven to 10 X more impactful, literally actually maybe even more. Um, you know, if you have a one-time product, your value of your company is, is, is a multiple of EBITDA. So like, it's like maybe one and a half times EBITDA, maybe like that's an average, Mm -hmm. but, um, when it's recurring revenue, it's valued completely different. Um, so th- there's that. There's what we've seen it do to people's lives. But I also just really, really believe in the model because I'm a subscriber to so many things and like from food to clothing to vitamins to juices to salads I have for lunch. Like I, it's, it's a, and the reason why I like being a subscriber um, is when brands do it well, it's a win win for the brand and the customer because I, if I'm a, if I buy let's just say a smoothie from a, a company one time, I'm mm-hmm. the uh, what I'm worth to them is very very little. Um, they'll spend very little to acquire me. They'll spend very little to service me, customer support. They'll spend very little to like they just really don't care that much about me. Versus if I'm a subscribed member, uh, the lifetime value that I am to them is. Mm-hmm about 700 times more than I'm if I'm a 100 if then if I'm a one time customer so they can spend more to acquire me they can spend more to service me they know me better because they have data on me they should be able to give me better like product recommendations and better um, a better experience overall so it's a better experience as a customer and then it's it's a better experience as a brand as well too because they have predictable revenue um, more valuable customers um, it helps with inventory control, like knowing what you're going to sell and need the next month. Like it's kind of, it's one of those mechanisms that it's a win-win for brands and for customers when done properly. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of subscription brands that are not doing it properly. They <laughs> they put they put on what I call like a, a subscribe and save band aid. They have a store. They sell a product. They install our subscription app, or it could be any. It doesn't have to be us. It could be any subscription app, and they slap on a subscribe and save. And they like think they're going to be successful because really they're just giving mm-hmm. a subscription option, but they're not becoming a subscription org. They're not changing how they think. How, you know, it's even as simple as like I always tell our brands like stop calling your customers customers and call them members because this is like super uh, basic, but like you treat members differently than than a customer. Yeah, they're a, they're a mm-hmm. member. They're worth more. They're more valuable. Spend more on them. Um, so that's another reason why we're passionate about it because I think it's a I think it's a when done properly a better experience for brands and for yeah. customers. So, like you said, though, so you know, subscription companies can be sold for you know amazing amount of money, but at the same time, getting one up and going is very difficult. So you see a lot of them fail before they get up and running. What do you, in your opinion, since you guys work with them all the time, what, what is it you yeah. see? that are like the ingredients of a successful subscription company versus someone like you mentioned where they just slap up subscribe and save as an option. Here's the number one mistake. I can almost always tell if a subscription brand is going to succeed or fail. If I ask uh, a brand, uh, what's the product? What is, what, is the, what is the value? What's the product that your, your subscriber gets when they subscribe? And mm-hmm. if, if, all they say it is while well, they get our, our they get our product, they get our vitamins, they get our coffee, they get our whatever, they get it every month and they save 10%. And, and if that's it, I can almost always tell they're doomed. Because if all they're getting is that product and the convenience of an auto refill, they're gonna hit the customers are gonna hit subscription fatigue in probably four to six months. And then we can get into this in a little bit, but they'll hit what I call the subscription death curve. And we see probably about 80 to 85% of subscription brands are in this. They're just completely flatlined. If I go in our data and I look at brands, a lot of them are just completely flat. They're churning 10% of their customers every month and they're paying Instagram and Facebook to, to bring in and they're just flat. They've hit that level. Yeah. But if, if I ask, so here's the, the key. So like <clears throat> you need to think of a subscription should be a component of a great membership. And what most brands don't do is they don't think about membership and what that really means. So a subscription is a billing decision. It's a shipping option. It's a shipping choice. It's not the value. The, it, it is, it'll, it, it's almost table stakes now. Like if you sell coffee and you don't 
you know, have a subscribe and save option on it. So a customer might go look somewhere else because it's just expected. It's not, it's no longer like what differentiates you. So um, when we look at subscription brands, there's really, um, there's kind of three models they fall under, or people typically think of them in three different models. They think of replenishment, curation, and access. And most of the time people would say they're in one of those models. They would say, I'm a replenishment uh, subscription. So like, let's stick with the coffee example. So I, um, I sell coffee. My customers get a bag of coffee every month and they save 10%. It's replenishment. Or if it's uh, curation, typically when we think of creation, curation, it's like the box of the months or something that's like different every month. Um, and then if it's access, it's uh, access to content on a website or access to like, uh, you know, tutorials or some learning or there's, you're paying for access to something. Maybe not even necessarily a product, but it's just access. So usually people think of themselves in one of those three buckets. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. We actually looked at, we've got around 20,000 brands using our subscription software and we looked at all of them and we tried it. Like we brought, looked at like the, I can't remember what it was. It was probably like the top 200. We looked at, try to find like trends that they were doing and things that were driving success for them. One of the biggest things that stood out is the most successful brands. Uh, their offering ha- almost always had an aspect of curation, replenishment and access, all three. So the, coffee example even though the customer subscribes for the coffee once a month you could for the curation aspect you could layer in each month you know like a different flavor that gets sent a roaster's choice each month or something um for access there's a hundred things you can do like access to vip pricing on the site while they're subscribed or when new flavors come out members only get access first or you know access Mm -hmm. to content access to communities the the founder of the coffee company could, you know, once a quarter do a zoom call with all members and have coffee with the founder. And he talks about how the beans are roasted or whatever. There's tons of things you could do. Partner discounts are a big one. You know, if I'm subscribed, I get, you know, 10%, maybe I'm like a yoga or a, you know, a mindfulness coffee brand. And so like, while I'm subscribed, I get a discount at, with my mindfulness apps and at yoga studios or whatever. So now when I, I hit that subscription fatigue, you know, like maybe I go on vacation and a couple of the bags of coffee build up. I'm not just losing. If I go to cancel it, I'm not just canceling that. My value isn't just the coffee. It's I'm losing everything else. I'm no longer getting 10% off on everything else in the store. My, my monthly, I get one bag once a month at 50% off because I'm a member. I get one offer once per month or whatever. Like I lose all of that. Um, so I usually tell brands, so back to that original question, when I ask a brand, like, what is the value that your customers get every month from being a subscriber? If they just say they get my product at a, at a subscriber safe discount, the value needs to be at least three times what they're paying for the product. So it's like a perceived value. So if you can kind of put a, you know, take a whiteboard and write all the benefits that your subscriber gets for being a member and, and put a, what is the value? They get that discount every month. They get that perk. They get that Zoom call. They get that partner benefit. So if my coffee subscription is $19 a month, there's, they should feel like they're getting roughly like a $60 value a month. So they're going to be very mm-hmm. sticky. And a great example of that is like Amazon Prime. Like no one cancels their membership because even if you don't order something from Amazon for two months, you're probably not going to cancel it because you might use their photo storage. You might use their Prime video. You might use... Alexa, I think I unplugged it before this, so it's not going to go off. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, there's all the other things that like that you use. And so that's uh, we, we just call it um, subscription value stacking. And we if, if so, if a, most subscription brands, when they start, they don't think about that at all. They slap on a subscribe and save. They try it for a few months and then they say, ah, subscriptions don't work for me. I, I like to pivot back because I really am curious about this one. What is this death curve you're referring to? <laughs> <laughs> So this is, um, uh, it, 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 we've noticed, and it's not just with e-commerce subscription. Um, this is across the board with like SaaS companies as well too. Any company that has a recurring mm-hmm. billing model, um, they often, no matter what the number is, if you're onboarding, you know, a thousand customers a month, 10 a month, it doesn't matter. Um, if you have a churn number, let's just say it's 10% and it, you know, you can acquire even if you can acquire a thousand customers a month through Instagram and Facebook, you're going to get to a point where your 
um, your acquisition your numbers you can bring in. So if you have if you have ten thousand customers a month and you're churning ten percent, if you're losing a thousand and acquiring a thousand, you'll eventually plat- plateau at a flatline at ten thousand. Um, if you if you're acquiring a hundred thousand customers a month, you'll flatline at a million. It's going to be at at some point. At some point, you can no longer onboard and you just and you just plateau. And most subscription um, companies that have a subscription model, they almost all hit it. The ones that don't are um, the ones that so there's like an you know Facebook and a really good example that I use a lot is Clubhouse that recently so they they grew like crazy. They they also shrunk like crazy after, but they had incredible mm-hmm. viral growth. And you could ask anyone there what their viral coefficient was, and they would know it to the T. Uh, same thing with like with Facebook, with Twitter, with anything. It's a metric they track, and the the viral coefficient is it. So you can if you have fifteen um, percent churn, which is very high. Most brands are like seven or eight percent, but let's say it's very high. If you have fifteen percent churn. You need every new subscriber to refer 1.2 friends or people to break out of that death curve. So if you have 20% churn, you need it's like 1.27. You can you can Google viral coefficient, figure out what it is, and it's the number of how every every user that signs up. And this is for software for every user that signs up, how many other users they have to bring in to have viral growth. And that that and then it, that number is just dependent on how high your churn is. So um, if you have zero churn, the the you can have viral growth at one point zero one. Like it can be hardly anything, mm-hmm. and it'll that'll that'll still grow exponentially. It's like your stock market. Like if you can make eight percent a year, you double every eight years. You know, um, yeah. but if you have churn, then that makes it need to be higher. So one of like one of the time like a lot of times I ask brands like you know what what your key metric is and they'll they'll say well we you know LTV and average subscriber size and we track customer acquisition cost and average order volume and churn and I almost never hear people say I track referred by friend as a key metric on, and what not, how many uh, how many new customers each existing subscriber refers. And it really should be a key metric for brands because uh, if you and, and the 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 problem is so there's two there's brands that have customers that love their product but they got really crummy referral programs and then they have <laughs> you have brands that have really good well thought out referral programs but they got the customers aren't happy with the product and so what i mean by a crummy referral program is if you sign up for something and then in your customer portal there's a link that says you know share this link and give anyone 10% off that's a crummy referral mm-hmm. program you're never going to you might post on facebook hey if anyone wants 10% off my salad subscription i just signed up for here's a link and it's like you're going you, to the, the type of customers you're going to get from that if any are crummy customers if i got let's say five links Let's just even say three, actually. If I got three links when I signed up, if it said, hey, we're giving you, Andrew, three links to share with friends that you think might also like a salad subscription who are trying to eat healthy, they're going to get two months free of salads. This is like a $100 value or something like that. Like, But you only get three. You can't like give this... A, you're going to think about who you give them to. You're going to like... You're probably going to phone them and say like, hey, Jay, like I got one of these salad subscription links like are you going to actually use it because i only have three and that's what happened with clubhouse clubhouse gave you five invites and i remember like texting people because i had people asking like hey jay can i get an invite and i would say well i only got five are you going to use it (laughs) so what that does is it it gets um a very highly engaged like right off the bat it's an engaged customer because like i'm i'm asking them hey are you going to use it They, they almost feel this obligation to to use it because i did them a favor so if I like, if say like, hey Andrew, like I only got three of these invites. Are you actually going to use this salad subscription? Because if not, I'll give it to someone who will. So you, there's that yeah. sense of obligation. You're also probably more of the, the ideal customer profile. You probably fit the customer they want. So you're likely to be a happy customer, and then you're also more likely to refer people. And and I only need 1.2 referrals. So if I, I only need if you know a lot of customers will refer none, but some will refer three, and that's fine. But that's an example of a great way to run a referral program. 
versus just the generic, you know, link. Um, yeah. And and then the other big thing is like most brands they don't they would they don't actually even know how how many customers a month are coming through referred by friend or or some referral mm -hmm. mechanism. Um, it can be as simple as having a form uh, when someone makes a subscription. Like, how did you hear about us? Like Google, Instagram, heard by friend, and find out what that number is. And if last month, like if there's any brands listening right now that run a subscription business, step one, like after this episode, like find out what that is. Like it might be, it might be 6% and that's okay. It could be really low, but make your goal next month to make referred by friend, like 8%. You know, it. you know it. And most brands don't even know it. And it should be like a North star metric because once you get to a certain point, your customers become your marketing channel and every customer you get, becomes more customers and you you don't even you don't need Facebook and, and other paid acquisition your cus it's becomes of and that's that's a viral coefficient like you don't actually mm -hmm. need advertising it every customer multiplies um so that's so do the you, subscription do you death curve. always do you always suggest like if you're gonna go the subscription route you should almost always have some kind of loyalty program tied in with it I yeah, like when you have subscribers, you t they're typically um, they're they're more engaged with your brand. Like, mm -hmm. perfect example is you, I you'll probably never subscribe to something and then forget the name of the company a week later. <laughs> and th this has happened to me multiple times with one time products. I needed one time some like I don't know it was like some hand lotion for my my son had like dry hands and I was like googling like toddler hand lotion and I found some like hand lotion. I ordered it. A week later, it hadn't come yet. And for the life of me, I couldn't remember the name of the company that I ordered from. <laughs> I had to search in my email hand lotion and I was trying to find like an order confirmation. I couldn't remember the name of the company. Mm -hmm. You probably will never subscribe to a company and forget the company because yeah. um, subscription by its very nature has lower conversion. It's a higher... It's a, it's a higher... More effort. It's more of a commitment to subscribe than to make a one-time purchase. So you're already getting uh, an in engaged customer who uh, who's way more likely to refer your brand than a one-time customer if you give them the right tools. And how many times have you had someone, you know, like I don't, so many people have like a FabFitFun membership or something, and they tell you, oh, you got to get this, you got to get on that. Like subscribers feel more connected to the brand, and and that goes back to the original thing we were talking about, like when done right. It is a better experience. Brands do know you better. They can give you a great experience, and so there is something to talk about. So, yes, hundred percent. I I think um, it is even more important for subscription brands than than one time yeah. brands. Yeah, and your your point your point to a lot of stuff is obviously very good. Um, my thought with the you know adding the extra value to the subscription, it's it, it's one of those things where like you know. It's unfortunate, but we have the same issue where we'll get we'll end up working with sellers and they'll be like, oh, you know, this is a product that they may need to purchase more often. So let's just add a subscribe and save option. And we'll be like, okay, what else do they get with it? And like, we'll give them a discount. I'm like, ah, oh, that's not, that's not going to entice them to do anything. And what I find like a lot of sellers don't think about is there's a lot of stuff you can offer that doesn't really cost you much. Or if it does, it's like a one-time build out of a program. So just like you mentioned, like if you're uh, you know, mindfulness and you have a discount to another yoga company, you're just developing a partnership with another company where, yeah, at that one time, you can offer a discount to your members. But at the same time, there's so much other stuff you can do with them as well, which is like, you know, if you start doing podcasts or if you're doing like different like newsletter exchanges or you're doing social stuff or you start working out like article things that you can do back and forth, like there's so much that you can leverage that outside of it. But even then, Everyone always thinks like, well, I'm going to give them 10% off. What else should I be giving them? Like, I can't go make uh, all of this and go buy a new product and couple it in. It just won't be worth it. Or maybe they don't have like the whole subscription box concept lined up. But there's so many other things that you could provide value with that, you know, it, it's usually amazing how many of them just kind of just throw up that subscription thing. Like, do you guys have that as a pretty common issue on through Bold? Very common. Um... And you know, like if you for like subscription brands listing, like if your customer next month, if they didn't get whatever the product is in the subscription, whatever the physical product is, if they would all cancel 
then you have a crummy subscription and it's probably not going to last. But if they, if you're, if, if they didn't get a product one month and there was still enough value around there, you've got a very healthy subscription. Um, and I would say like one of the easiest things you can do, like I get it. Like a lot of brands are like, well, what else can I do? Like I, I just, you know, I sell toothpaste and I, I want to have a sub- subscription option on it or something like at bare minimum, give your subscribers, you know, have the customers be tagged and, you know, give them a higher loyalty point um, redemption or earning rate. So like members earn points fast, like Costco, like you pay to be a member and executive members and regular members, like you earn more points or they can redeem at better rates. Um, yeah. Give them, give them, um, make their returns be for six months instead of 30 days or, um, you know, there's, there's benefits. Like there's, there is always stuff you can do, even if you don't have like, you know, maybe you don't have a, a community or maybe you don't have content that you're producing. Um, there's other perks and, and like, by all means, like, <laughs> like anytime you release a new product, let your members have access to it first, like email them, mm-hmm. um, put it on a hidden collection and you know, it's some, you can, you can password protect it or however you want to do it. But email all your members and say, "Hey, we got this. This new product's coming out. We always we're giving you exclusive access to it for 30 days as your member. Um, simple things like that. Like that stuff goes a long way. Like, um, and all those things add up to perceived value. And at some point, that customer is going to think about canceling that subscription. And each one of those things adds weight to them." keeping it. Oh, but if I cancel it, oh yeah, there was this, there was that, there was that. Yeah. Um, there's very few brands that they, there's like nothing they can do. Like, I think there's always mm-hmm. something you can do. Um, so I, I, you know, take like, I, I just say like, get a whiteboard, take a product out of it and just, mm-hmm. just, and write down three titles, curation, replenishment, access, and start jotting down things under each of those that they can do in those buckets. What can they do from for access and and access and I put I lump partner stuff under access, but um, fill as much as you can in those. Um, and and the other big thing I would say this kind of goes to this question that I think a lot of subscription brands don't do is because they come from this mindset of being a one time brand and they they're so focused on customer acquisition cost and what they want to spend for a customer. Um, your subscription customers are worth a lot more. And it's like, we have a dashboard that shows what LTV of customers are, but if you don't like, you can just assume they're at least double. Most times they're like, have at least a four times higher LTV. Um, You can, you can be creative with ways that you convert them. So not necessarily spending more on paid acquisition, but you can maybe give them like their first month, for free, or you could give them like a very heavily discounted, um, in incent- some way to incentivize them to get on. Or when, when they sign up for a coffee subscription, they get, uh, a hat and a shirt and like some, some really like a hundred dollars worth of merch because they signed up for a coffee mm-hmm. subscription. Like it would seem crazy. But if you think about that as customer acquisition cost, and then you look at like, okay, I'm normally, normally I'm willing to spend $32 to acquire a customer. Well, now if I times that by minimum two, maybe up to four, cause it's a subscriber. Well, I should be okay spending like a hundred dollars to acquire a customer. Like the unit economics need to make sense, but depending on yeah. what your brand is, what your product is like, consider whatever um, perks you get to have them sign up as customer acquisition costs. I think a lot of subscription brands mm-hmm. are afraid to do that. Um, but it's 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 a cost to acquire a customer. It's it's genius, and it, it you know it kind of makes you think too because there's it it in a way it's almost like there really isn't that many products out there that you couldn't have some kind of subscription and or membership option to it because even if like I'm a Kaiser Soze this thing, but if I sell mugs <laughs> right like you can yeah you can have a subscription to get a mug every month maybe if it's a different mug and you like different mugs fine. But that's difficult. But your other option is like you set up a membership and they just every month we send you something that could go in that mug or we send you some swag that you get or you get, you know, if it's uh, <laughs> stuff that's outdoor mugs kind of thing, you could have like content that you're constantly giving them access to of influencer interviews and things like that that only members get. And it's like 
you know, the, it's almost like a completely different revenue stream that you could add to your e-commerce business. Even if you think your product isn't subscription worthy, it could be very well membership. Totally. There's a brand. Um, I think it's, I think it's called, uh, I think it's called Steel City Tees or Steelers Tees. It's it's a it's a t-shirt company that makes um, clothing around Pittsburgh Steelers. And what they decided to do a couple of years ago was to go only to membership. You can't actually they they they've got a bit of a following and they make these awesome Pittsburgh Steelers t-shirts. And it's like it's kind of like mm-hmm. they're very um, pop culture. So like you know it might be something from like something that happened in the game recently or something or I don't know. They're not. and so now you can only get them. You get uh, you, I can't remember the exact details, but it's like you, you pay for membership and you get four a year or you can get one a month or you pick your amount. And then each month you get to pick which one you want. So you're like, you're going to buy half a dozen t-shirts a year, but you can only get them if you're a member. Like you have to, you have to have a subscription. So you, you know, it's not a subscription, it's a membership, <laughs> but that really just gives you access to buy it. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of clothing brands that could benefit from that. Yeah. Do you have a referral link for that? <laughs> I'm a I'll diehard Steelers it. fan. I've never heard of that. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, good, good timing. I will. I will. What a, I'll, what a, I'll look it up. It's all right. Uh, sorry about your team this year, though. Just kidding. Yeah. Hey, we uh, uh, But I'm just joking. It'll, it'll Wait, probably no, didn't they it. make. <laughs> Wasn't there some stat they made the playoffs with the worst record they've ever had? Yeah, it was. Uh, it it. I mean, it very well could be the worst record we ever had for pl- making. But the you're playoffs. in the playoffs. Yeah, but we made it. Yeah, I and mean, we won't yeah. last long. But we're in there. I guess it's I all counts. So, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Hey, look what happens when you're yeah. sixteen and 0, <laughs> sixteen and zero going into the playoffs, right? That's a very good point. Um, but. Jay, I really appreciate having you on the show. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, this is that quintessential moment where I kind of let you have your moment and tell everyone <laughs> where we can find out more about you. Yeah, um, I'm fairly... So boldcommerce.com is um, where all of our products, everything is. Um, I'm fairly active on Twitter and LinkedIn. It's uh, Jason N. Myers. If you want to follow me and, and, and like or bash anything I tweet, that's fine too. Um, yeah, I would <laughs> say those two places are, are good. Perfect. Jay, really appreciate having you on the show. Everyone who tuned in, obviously appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure you rate, review, subscribe, wherever it is you guys are sitting around. But until next time, we will see you all again. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker a full-service digital marketing company specifically for e-commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of The Ecom Show.